So thank you for doing this, Brenna. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're here um, uh, launching your book here in North America or in Vancouver. And I just wanted to ask you a few questions about your book. So straight off, why did you write this book? Well, um, thanks for doing this little interview about the book, Mike. Um, I uh, wrote the book for a few different reasons. One was uh, that I was interested in exploring the relationship between modern property laws and race. And I was really interested in, in uh, building on the work of scholars like Cheryl Harris, and her article, Whiteness is Property, which has been is a wonderful piece of scholarship and has been really influential. And, and, I was, and what should people know about that? Um, so one of the arguments in, in the article, Whiteness is Property, is that, uh, is, is that race and racial identities mm -hmm. um, come to operate in a way that is analogous to the way that property operates. And that, um, in some senses, race and processes of racialization emerge in conjunction with modern laws of property. And she traces that both through um, some of the histories of slavery, transatlantic slavery uh, in, in, in the U.S., and also uh, the dispossession of indigenous lands. Um, so I was interested, uh, that article has been enormously influential and I was really interested in um, <clears throat> um, furthering that line of inquiry. Um, in terms of thinking about race, I, I um, draw from the work of Cedric Robinson and his theory of racial regimes uh, in order to think about how um, the co-emergence of property laws and race uh, come to form what I call racial regimes of ownership, but in ways that are unstable mm -hmm. and produce different kinds of contradictions and ambiguities. And uh, I felt, uh, I believe that his theory of racial regimes is very useful because it helps us identify uh, the points of weakness or instability in what comes to look like a hegemonic formation. And that is how we st can also start to think about histories of resistance and also uh, future um, areas for points for, for uh, uh, resistance and refusal. Oh, that's interesting. Just because I'm thinking racial regimes, I'm reminded of what Michelle Alexander wrote in her book about... Um, um, racial caste actually in America mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is that similar in in the sense of what she's getting at in terms of uh, the incarceration of, of black men in America and well I think that um, what is important to bear in mind is that um, these histories of uh, dispossession of yeah. First Nations land and uh, histories of slavery, histories of indentured labor, and their relationship to property, because I believe there is a fundamental relationship here to the formation of private property relations, um, is never exactly the same in each place. You know, so I look at Australia and Canada and Palestine amongst uh, drawing on a number of other examples uh, in, in various chapters, uh, examples from different places. And what I try and emphasize in the book is that while there is a, a relationship between the emergence of modern concepts of race and modern laws of property that evolve through colonial encounters in a lot of different places, and even though the legal techniques to create modern laws of property and to shore up what I call the racial regime of ownership mm. replicate themselves in various places, they do not produce uh, the exact same outcomes in each places. Um, of course, the specificities of each particular context really matter. Um, so I think the way racial caste operates in the context of incarceration uh, and black and Latino populations in, in the U.S. is going to be very different 
uh, from the way racial caste operates in other contexts, uh, while, of course, there being some fundamental similarities. Sure. Yeah. Um, I also like the title of your book, Colonial Lives of Property. Uh, why did you choose that title, uh, and how did you arrive at that title? Um, well, I uh, uh, had some input from various people uh, on the title, and my partner actually came up with the Colonial Lives of Property part. Oh. Then the subtitle, Law, Land, and Racial Regimes of Ownership, uh, I came up with, so it was a joint effort. But I like the Colonial Lives of Property uh, title for many reasons, and, and the um, main editor at the press liked it a lot as well, because um <clears throat> because it it evokes um the way in which property has many lives and has many different mm -hmm. uh guises and manifestations um it also evokes the uh the, the what i just had mentioned previously that we see a similar kind of formation or techniques of dispossession replicating themselves in a variety of different colonial contexts. So the plural lives, I think, reflects this, uh, um, this, this formation that travels, you know, through mm -hmm. different colonial sites along a different, well, through kind of colonial circuits. Um, so, yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. And just lastly, so, and you've touched upon this already, but in the book you explain how the ideas of property and land ownership are actually developed through colonization. Mm -hmm. Could you give us an example of one of the uh, issues that you look at and, and expand on that about how property is developed through colonization? Sure. So um, an example uh, I've used uh, in the book to look at this uh, sort of boomerang effect in a way <laughs> is uh, uh, the example of the torn system of land titling. Uh, so there were attempts to impose a nationwide system of um, land title by registration. So you prove your ownership through registering it in, a, in an administrative archive. Mm -hmm. um, there were attempts to impose that in the UK on a nationwide level um, over uh, many years, but there was quite a bit of resistance to mm -hmm. this system of land ownership, mm -hmm. um, or I should say this system of registering title on the part of uh, the aristocracy, on the part of the legal profession for various reasons. And uh, so Torrens goes to South Australia. And, and Torrens um, is who? Uh, Richard Robert Torrens is a uh, colonial administrator who, who um, has some work experience as, um, as a customs officer um, <clears throat> before he embarks on his career as a colonial administrator in South Australia. So he sees the, the way in which cargo is registered and he looks at these cargo registrations and, and starts to, with a very commoditized view of land, starts to make the argument, well, if we can have uh, uh, registries for these other forms of property, why can't we have a registry for land? And of course, he models it on an already existing uh, mo mode of land registration, title by registration in Germany. Uh, okay. So these systems do exist elsewhere. Borrowed from Germany. Yes, uh, developed from that system. And, and um, in 1858, um, as a part of the colonial government in South Australia, they impose the system that comes to be known as the Torrent system of, of land registration. Now that doesn't find its way back to the UK for many decades, uh, you know, 60 or 70 years before it's really imposed on a nationwide um, uh, level. So that's an example of where that colonial encounter viewing mm -hmm. indigenous lands as a terra nullius, where they could impose whatever kind of system of private property they wanted to, the colonists wanted to impose, actually, uh, um, means that they use the colonial space as a kind of laboratory for testing out uh, different uh, what kinds of uh, land laws. And so um, that, that's one example. I mean, there's a, a, a fair bit of other work on colonial history that shows, again, how um, different doctrines um, have been developed in colonial context. So uh, 
you know, the jurisprudence of emergency by Nasser Hussein, a book published uh, some time ago, uh, looks at how the laws of emergency developed in the colonial context. Um, uh, and, and we see now in contemporary European contexts how much laws of emergency are used, France being an, an excellent example, although I know that relates to a different colonial history. But um, so the, the one around, Hussein looks at in, in, in the uh, subcontinent. Law looking at the state of emergency. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think there's lots of examples that people could uh, um, explore uh, for, you know, further research in this area. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good, potentially productive way of understanding the development of the common law. And what are some of the future projects now that you've finished this book? Is there something that's on the horizon? Yeah, I'm working on a project right now with my um, colleague Rafif Ziada on mm. critical race feminisms. And that mm. project, uh, which we are <clears throat> in the midst of, involves a series of interviews with uh, feminist, uh, feminist scholar activists exploring uh, their political formation mm. and um, thinking about what we can learn from and also uh, what we can continue to develop uh, um, from that rich, varied, but very rich history of um, left uh, anti-racist feminist uh, scholarship and organizing. Great. Well, thank you so much and good luck with that new project. Thanks, Mike.